there everyone and welcome to our second annual World Fitness Business Owners Summit. I'm Delina Scoble and along with Rana Saini, we're the proud co-founders of WF Boss. And if you've checked out our website this year, we've got a massive lineup for you. Can't wait to kick off our next session right now with the absolute legend, a record-setting five-time Olympian and Olympic gold medalist, Natalie Cook, along with our very special guest interviewer, Jeremy Weiss, founder of Inspired Insider. So welcome guys, great to have you back at the full summit. It's Thanks good to be us. here, thank you. Yeah, I can't wait to kick off, but just firstly, I just want to actually take time to thank you, the listeners, for investing into WF Boss this year. You know, it's, this is an investment into your education and not many people take this step. So I just want to personally congratulate you because it is people like you who end up becoming successful, you know, who go to that next level because of your commitment to your education. So good on you and we expect nothing less but to over deliver on value to you in WF Boss 2013. And also, too, thanks for participating on our social media sites, in particular our Facebook page. We've had a bunch of testimonials come in during our free pre-summit series, which is really awesome. We love hearing from you, so uh, make sure you keep leaving us comments and notes over there on our WF Boss page. So now it's an absolute honour to introduce to you our very special WF Boss presenters today, uh, Natalie Cook. She is in the record books as the first ever Australian female to compete in five Olympic Games. Go Aussie. Uh, she's also, she's an Olympic gold medalist from 2000 and Olympic bronze medalist from 1996. As an author, speaker and entrepreneur, Nat is now helping to motivate and inspire others to fulfill their dreams and squeeze all the goodness out of business and life. With so much to draw upon, it will be difficult not to be inspired in this session by Nat's story of self-identity, resilience and mental toughness. So you are in for a real treat right now as Nat and Jeremy are about to share with you part two of how to overcome personal or business challenges to win gold. So just a quick bit of housekeeping before I pass the screen over to these guys. If this is your first webinar, just note that everyone's on mute so we can't hear you, we can't see you. If you do have a question for Nat during this presentation, just type it into your question box which you'll find on your control panel, most likely on the right hand of your screen right now. And uh, we will have questions, if you, you've got questions that come up during the presentation, um, I'll jump in and ask on your behalf and we'll also have some time at the end as well for question and answer time. So without further ado, let's get the show on the road and uh, as, like I said, such an honour to now pass over the screen to Jeremy Nat. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I am really excited, Nat, because you have so much great information how people can overcome personal, you know, personal and business challenges to achieve their gold medal moment. So we'll get to your gold medal moment, but we want to hear some of the the real pain along the way. And before I ask that, you know, we always like to include a fun fact about the guest. And fun fact about Nat is she dresses up as Superman to speak, to play with kids, and even to dress up and watch Superman on the couch. Tell us why you do that. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Jeremy, I think uh, life has got all too serious. We take ourselves way too serious. So um, my favorite superhero character is Superman and sometimes we go through life and we find it challenging for ourselves to, to achieve our goals and if you can become your superhero for just a moment uh, and get yourself out of your own way uh, because you can't solve a problem with the thinking that generated the problem. So I become Superman for that moment and can find that I can overcome any obstacle. But uh, my three-year-old godson had his birthday just last week and I dressed up as Superman for his birthday party and walked through the park and the amount of not only kids but adults that um, smiled or said, hello Superman, and uh, it's just, you know, it just lightens things up and makes uh, it easier for you to get on with it. Yeah. So, you know, I want to talk and people want to hear about some of those, you know, things that you had to overcome to win the gold and to be obviously in the Olympics so many times. Let's start off first with one of those painful moments. Can you tell us about that bronze medal playoff? Yeah, that was probably the toughest match of my life, playing in Athens for an Olympic medal, a bronze medal. 
I had won bronze in Atlanta in 96, I won gold in Sydney in 2000, and I was in the bronze medal playoff in Athens. No other athlete had had the opportunity to win a medal at all of those Olympics. And um, I went into the Olympics with a shoulder injury that I wasn't quite sure of how far I would get through the tournament. Um, my physios and my medical team and my coach and my partner were all aware and we got all the way through to the medal matches and you're playing for the last time in Athens was I had nothing to lose. So if I hurt my shoulder even further or did the damage to it, I could go home and get it fixed. And so I laid it all out on the court and you can see by the picture on the screen it it, it tore, the rotator cuff tore and um, I did have to end up playing left-handed um, and my partner and I had to come up with some very extreme strategies on on standing in the middle of the court together. Now the court is very big as it is but and we usually split the court in half but we had to stand on top of each other so that she could run and get the ball. Uh, it was it was hard to do and the best part is we almost won. You know, The American team we were playing against was so afraid to lose in that situation that we almost pulled it across the line. We lost 15-12 in the third set um, and it was really a, a, a nail biter for everyone in the crowd and the pain was probably the most I've ever felt um, in a match and yeah it was tough to leave that arena giving everything I had and not coming home with a medal but that's sport, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I mean it's tough enough to play at that level with two arms and you have one arm that you're playing with so what are you thinking mentally at that time to get through? Because you are competing at a high level, and you said it, the game is close, the matches are close. So what are you thinking internally to get through that? Well, obviously it's about shifting the focus from the pain, which is easiest to do. It's easiest to focus on what's not going right and, and the painful um, emanating out of the shoulder, and that affects the brain. So the first thing I had to do was focus on something else, distract me, keep my attention on the, the scoreboard, keep my, my attention on what was going right and what we could do and I knew I only had a short period of time to do that for and, and you know pain, the pain will only last a short time so I was focusing on what I could do, focusing on getting myself in the best position, putting my partner in the best position so she could do as much as she could and uh, yeah the, I mean it got, the pain got worse when I stopped because obviously that's when I thought about it but you just, it's like anything in life, it's about focusing on what you can do, focusing on the outcome that you're trying to achieve, which was to win an Olympic medal, and then going for it 100% with full commitment, and if it doesn't happen, which it didn't for us, we didn't win, um, you deal with that later, but you've got to give it everything you can. Do you remember your partner saying anything at the time that kind of got you pumped up, even though you're in excruciating pain? Yeah, the fact that, uh, you know, again, Nicole could have said, oh, no, we can't do this, Nat's hurt, you know, poor me for herself being left on with the responsibility. But one moment she turned to me and she looked me in the eyes and she said, we can do this, I'll take care of you. And it was just like mm. this feeling of support, this feeling of, you know, she's in this, we're in this together, she's going to do everything she can. And I could just let down that little bit of, sort of leadership responsibility and let her run the show and for me to do what I could. So that was great when you know you've got a teammate beside you that's got your back and that, that's prepared to do what it takes then that's the most comforting thing you can hear at that point. Then all I knew was that I just had to keep one foot in front of the other and, uh, and do what I could. Yeah, that's great. And so what are some things that kept you from giving up? I mean, obviously there's a lot of ups and downs with when you're practicing, when you're competing. What are some things that have kept you from giving up throughout your career? Well, the, as an athlete, as an eight-year-old athlete, when I had a dream to be an Olympian, uh, the Olympic Games goes every four years. So mm -hmm. that feels like a long time, but it does come around very quickly. And so once, once you focus on going to the Olympics and, and – we achieved a bronze medal in Atlanta. Of course, the next Olympic Games is in, in Sydney, in my home country. And so we're focusing on winning there. And you just set little goals along the way because four years out is, is a long way to keep your mind focused on it. It's really long. But, yeah. But it is, 
it's so inspiring and so exciting to be part of the Olympic team. It just is like, of course I'm going to go to the next one and the next one and the next one. And even for Rio, my brain says, of course I want to go to Rio in 2016. Uh, and then my body has a talking to it and says, you've been going 20 years now, it's time to give somebody else a go. But um, I just love it. Uh, what, what keeps me going is, is the thrill of competition and being on the big stage and entertaining the crowd and, and inspiring young kids. And when people buy a ticket to come and see you play and, you, and you're on show, you give your best performance, four years of all your work comes into one week of competition. And I just love it. I just love being a part of the Olympic Games. Tell me, how, so how does your family and friends play a role in you in this achievement? You can't achieve like anything in life can't be achieved on your own. It, no man is an island and um, they're really very special for me. My mum and dad have supported me from obviously when I was born but from a sporting perspective dad was a semi-professional soccer player in London, mum was a swim teacher and she taught me how to swim. They were always supportive of my sporting endeavours so they would take me to practice, they would pay for things, they would always be there when I needed them and then as I blossomed and got older and more mature and could drive myself and pay for my own things, you know, they were just a big support. So they've been to five Olympic Games too, you know, I don't know that there's many parents that have been to five, so when you've got an athlete that goes to five, to have them at every single Olympics with my brother David um, is just very special, you know, to see the joy on their faces, to have them experience everything with me um, it is great. So. They can't, and friends as well, you know, your friends have to be respectful that when you're training and you say no that you can't go out to parties and you have to go to bed early, that they, you know, they try and coax you along for a little bit but at the end of the day they know that you've got a job to do and they're respectful of, yeah. of my chosen profession. So, but without their support and without them um, being there when I, when I need them, it was very selfish when I needed them and had a phone call and said, you know, do you want to go out? They were ready to go out. And I had a friend, Shelley, fly from Australia to Athens to watch me play in that bronze medal game, one game. She flew over for a day and a half and then flew home. Um, so that's what friends are about. It's great. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a good point, which is when, you know, you're achieving at one of the highest levels, you have to, to have a lot of sacrifices. There's things you can't do because you're training and you're focused. What are some of those things that you had to or give up or put off because you were in so intense training mode? Because I feel like you know, people are, you know, you're so focused. What are some of those sacrifices that you made? Yeah, well, the building blocks of a professional athlete and, and a professional at anything, um, but especially athletics, is nutrition. So you've always got to be conscious of what you're eating. You know, your friends having pizza parties and beers and and I go to those parties for a small period, you know, like an hour or two hours and take my chicken salad, you know. So you, first thing's nutrition. The second thing is that um, when you're physically active all the time, you want to rest. So that my favourite place is to go with the movies uh, or go for a swim in the pool because it's relaxing and floating and and laying down and reading a book so you know because we've got six hours a day of physical activity you really do want to rest the body so the sacrifice of, you know friends would say oh do you want to go on a hiking trip well no hiking would be the worst thing I could do after a 30 hour week of running around a sandpit um, so it really was just sacrificing some of those opportunities that I had with friends uh, the nutrition side of things but you know I can now have a donut now and then, I can have french fries, I can have some chocolate, but you, you know, you definitely want to make sure your body's functioning at its height. Yeah. I want some, to hear some of your strategies because that is sometimes easier said than done. You know, those things are tempting us all the time and there's one strategy I want you to talk about which is just, when I heard it, I'm like, this is amazing. Um, and it has to do with surrounding yourself, you know what I'm talking about, but before you talk about how do you not give in to those temptations? Like people right now, maybe they're having some personal or business challenges and they're having those things kind of tempt them. When those things come up, how do you navigate that? Well, it starts at the beginning with what do you want 
in life and what is your gold medal goal? You know, for me it was easy to say as an Olympian I wanted to win a gold medal, but in life or in business you have to set your clear desire of your what is your gold medal. And then once you know that and you can determine um, the steps it takes to get there, then you've got to layer in the discipline. So that requires some preparation. So from a food point of view where I had to prepare and take my chicken salad, it would have been quite easy to say, I'll just have a piece of pizza. Right. Um, but it's about the preparation. So if you know along the steps the plan to get to where you want, there are certain temptations or roadblocks, then it's preparing in advance of what they are. Now, one of the things I did was surround myself with gold. You know, I wanted a gold medal, so everything in my life was gold. I had gold sunglasses, gold volleyballs, gold toaster, gold sheets, palm olive gold. You know, I even brushed my teeth with a gold toothbrush, and Colgate was a gold toothpaste. You know, it was just surround and the smell of palm olive gold. Now, when I smell that, it feels like being on top of the podium. So, when mm. the purpose of surrounding yourself with all of those things is so that every time you look at it, it reminds you of what it is you desire, which means that it's harder for you to fall off the wagon and, and take a temptation because your brain constantly sees gold. So on my fridge, which most fridges are white or silver, I would write the word in big letters, gold. So that every time I went to the fridge to grab a chocolate or something, I would like close the fridge because I knew that I wanted to win that gold medal more than the temptation of a piece of chocolate. Yeah, that's so powerful. When you told me that, surrounding myself with gold, and that makes so much sense. And you know, we could do the same exact tactics in our in our everyday life, whatever applies to us. And so, you know, you talked about that most painful moment, you know, the bronze medal playoff. Tell us about that proud moment. Tell us, tell us what happened in Sydney. Wow. It, it was like the best time of our lives. Kerry and I were playing on Bondi Beach with 10,000 screaming Aussies um, with our famous Aussie sport chant, which goes a little bit like this, Jeremy, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. And then the crowd goes, oi, oi, oi. And it just lifts your energy, your spirit to a new level. Um, playing in front of friends and family, the, the crowd was like a cauldron. You really felt close unlike a big football stadium where you're a long way away, like we could reach out and touch the crowd. It was, it was so close. And to, to have a dream come true and to have a lifetime goal achieved on one given day when all of the, all of the stars had to align for it all to come together, it was just very special to, to be on top of the Olympic podium singing Advance Australia Fair, like really badly but loud and proud an Olympic gold medal around your neck. It, it was the greatest moment of my life. So what was going through your mind when you were on that podium? Yeah. Um, it, it's like an, ex not so much your mind, through your body it's like an explosion of emotion. So every single emotion that you could list all exploding like fireworks at once. So even the, even the bad emotions of fear and anger and, and um, frustration all come together too because they've been experienced over the journey and they all come together and explode and so your body just feels amazing and then your mind's going wow this actually happened dreams do come true um, this is the greatest thing ever and you're trying to spot all your friends and family and um, you're like wow this is pretty cool I'm the best in the world at beach volleyball it's awesome that is amazing and we'll talk about some of those kind of steps from the low to the high and what shaped you. What, can you tell us about one of those struggles? What happened when you came back after that year off? Because that was a tough point. Yeah, after my fourth Olympics in Beijing, I, my body needed a rest. My, I had, had three knee surgeries. I'd had a shoulder reconstruction. You know, every single day for the past 15 years at that point, I had thought about, breathed, eaten, beach volleyball, you know. And so I needed a year off. I decided that I would do nothing. So I had no physical activity in that year off. Um, you know, not even go to the gym. I played a bit of golf and a bit of tennis. 
And then when I came back, it was a rude shock. You know, my, my, my mind said, you'll be fine. It's only a year. And so the, the, the rebuilding of the physicality and the mentality at that point, it took 12 months. It took 12 months again before I felt like a, an Olympic athlete. Um, and every single day just built little steps. And that was one of the most challenging times for me because there are plenty of times there I wanted to give up. And I just kept focused on London. I kept focused on the thought of being on top of the podium again and being in Horse Guards Parade and surrounding myself with that vision of what London would look like and feel like to um, keep me going every day. But when you're out, you know, a champion is determined when nobody's looking, you know, when you're out there by yourself and right. it's raining and you're on your own training and you want to stop, there's no one watching, it's quite easy for you to go to the shower and go home and you continue to do the program and you probably go one or two steps further and do more sit-ups and do more sprints just because you know that you have to to be the best. Yeah. Was there anything at that point in that year, you said it took you about a year that you felt like you were back, that you remember being influential with your coach or teammates that they said to you or pushed you? It was actually the real, the hardest time of my life because Tams and my volleyball partner lived in Melbourne and I lived in Brisbane. So we were two hours away by plane and she had a family, she had a, a son, um, that she so she had her year off pregnant and birthing a child, Ali. And so when she came back, she had similar challenges, but she didn't want to leave her family. So she stayed in Melbourne, I stayed in Brisbane. So it really was, we were on our own. We were, I was with our coach, Steve. So I had him to come every day. And I would literally put a chair on the court where Tamsin would stand and I would talk to the chair like it was Tamsin. It, it, and, and so it didn't talk back to me. She didn't talk back to me, but I felt like we were having... Um, an emotional or a, or a conversation, but my coach Steve was very important in that process of helping me build the mental picture of, of the steps that it would take throughout the next three years to achieve. So it, it was more myself building my own mental resilience and my own mental strategy to say, you can do it. And it really is about layering in the can because too easily our mind can say you can't. Oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. That's too hard, you won't do that. That comes off the top of our tongue very easily. When you train your mind to say you can, you will, it's possible, um, you want to, that is when the power comes. And that takes a long time. That, that could take some people 10 years before they master that. It's an awareness in your brain to stop yourself when you hear a can't and go, I can. Even if your body feels like you can't, it really is about tricking it in the mind to, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can. and it's like a crack record. Uh, even when your performance and my body is saying no, um, and waiting for the body and the reality to catch up is really the most powerful thing I've ever done. Yeah, and oftentimes we don't get to where we are without mentors. And so I wanna hear some of the best advice you've gotten from yours Starting from when you were young, tell me about what your grandfather used to tell you. Yeah, my granddad was an amazing figure in my life. I used to come home from the swimming pool, um, and interestingly enough, I would come second a lot. I had this one particular rival who was half my size, and she was just like a speed demon in the pool. And I'd come home from um, swimming, and he'd say, did you win? And I'd say, no, I came second. And he's... He, would, he wouldn't even comment, he'd just walk away. And then every time he'd say, did you win? No, I just I came second. And then one day I won and beat this girl and she never beat me ever again. So the time it changed, he, he'd say, did you win? And I said, yes, I won. And I got so excited and he just walked away. So like there was no difference between second and first. And then the next day or the next competition, he wouldn't say, did you win? He'd say, how much did you win by? And so I constantly started to keep moving the goalpost so that it became a self-driven desire to raise my own standard because winning at that point wasn't enough. I thought I'd won and that was good 
and he wouldn't ask me again. But then it became about how much did you win by? I mean, that's like how long's a piece of string? So he was very influential in, in that part and then by the end I would, you know, sit on his lap and, and give him a big hug and he would just, the next question was, this was one of my favourites, he would say, did you meet anybody today that you liked better than yourself? Hmm. And I was, I just, the first time I heard that I thought, that is really weird. <laughs> and he, he, what, what he was trying to do was to say you have to surround yourself with people that are going to lift you to a new level and that you are inspired to be around and be around positive people. It was the best way I've ever heard it. So when you find someone that you like better than yourself or you like being around, then you want them on your team because that's what keeps you excited every day. So he was huge in my life. Yeah, I love that. And he kind of just kept elevating your game with just some simple questions. And so the next, obviously, huge influential person was Steve Anderson, and he coached you for 17 years. Is that right? Yeah. So <laughs> tell me a uh, magical moment or a moment where he just pushed you. Yeah. I'm well, sure Steve, right, Steve's there in the middle. Um, he's African-American, and we brought him out of the U.S. We, we said to Steve in 1994, would you move to Australia and work for $200? Now, remember, $200 Australian dollars back then was probably – 120 American dollars a week and live in one of our houses and take us to win an Olympic gold medal in Atlanta. So of course, you know, he's crazy. He said yes. He moved over and he was with me for 17 years. We, we didn't go to Beijing together. I had another coach but um, he has shaped my whole life through his philosophy and the way he coaches that there was this particular time where he was starting to push um, just before Atlanta and we were sitting on, we'd, we'd come to practice and we were sitting on the ground doing a talk before we started and he, he said to me, how much do you want this? And I said, you know, a lot. I, I really want it. And he asked me probably 10 times, do you really want it? And I said, yeah, of course, I told you I really wanted it. And then he would say, do you really, really want it? And he would keep, again like my grandfather, he would keep escalating the bar until I got to a point where I was like, you are doubting my commitment. How dare you doubt my commitment? I'm here every day. I show up and do what you tell me to do. And I'm in this for the long haul. And I built this emotion up inside me where I just wanted to punch him. And I couldn't do that in case I hurt my hand. So what I did was I picked up this bag of balls, volleyballs, and it's in like a tube, five of them. And I went to swing it like a baseball bat to hit him in the head to because he was I was so mad I'd never got built up to that level of anger with someone doubting me and I fortunately hit him in the shoulder I didn't hit him in the head but I swung this at him and smashed and I was so scared after hitting him that I dropped the balls and just took off like a five-year-old kid and he stood up and chased me and then he realized that you know it was a, a letting off of emotion so he stopped and eventually I sort of with my tail between my legs, I walked back and, and we had a hug and, you know, it was a moment that he was trying to get me to explode. It, it was done purposefully and then when we got on with practice. So after that, I really got to a point that I did really want it and I was prepared to do anything, even hit him. Um, that was the only bit of anger or violence I've ever had with him. Well, maybe only bit of violence I've had with him. I get angry at, I used to get angry at him all the time, but... Because, uh, you know, coaches, he said to us, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to deliver you a gold medal. And when you've got an intimate relationship with three people, so Steve is the coach and Kerry as my partner and, and, and myself, you know, and you travel the world together as three, sometimes you want to be friends. But he was very good at drawing the line. When it was time to be coach, there was no friendliness. Right. So... When you said that, I'm thinking, how did you get him to come to Australia under those circumstances? Because someone like who's listening to this may be looking at someone, a key employee or a key partner, and they're trying to influence them to come on board. How did you get him to move to Australia for $120 a week? Uh, it's all about, and this is everything in life, relationships, business, family, sport. It's about the power of the dream. 
if you can sell the power of the dream to someone, then you'll have them for life. It's your ability to sell the power of the dream. So Kerry and I like looked at Steve and we said, this is what we want. We believe we can do it. We believe it's going to take you to get us there. Imagine being at the Olympics, winning a gold medal for Australia. No one, everyone in Australia says it can't be done. You know, that's the best thing. Wave the flag of it's not possible because you then get to see the people that are ready to do what it takes. And he, he stood up. He's like, that sounds like a good dream. I'd like to be a part of that. He was American. He thought, I could take these Aussies to a gold medal and create a name for himself. Now he's one of the number one coaches in the world and he's just been poached over to Canada to head up the Canadian beach volleyball men's and women's teams coaching because of what he did here in Australia. So when I retired, he, he decided that he would go and take on a new challenge and he's gone from the green and gold to the red and white. So what's so they, what obviously, is... they obviously sold him the dream too. So uh, my dream had run out and he went to a new one. What's one of those Steve philosophies that you remember so well? Oh, there's 17 years of it now is all sort of meshed into one. But, um, you know, for the main overarching theme for him was to have the faith, to be able to trust in the process, which, which he was very good at. He could see the four years. He could see the daily improvement. He could see he would construct an environment for us to succeed or, or even construct an environment where we would struggle so that we could learn to succeed. And, and you had to have the faith. So we had to do the things he was asking us to do, even if we were really bad at it, with the faith that with the practice and the belief, it would come off. So he's really taught me to have the faith that if I put my mind to it and I put my dream out there, I just you know, walk the path and good things happen. And if, you know, he's also taught me the resilience that if they don't happen, then create another path, create another vision and get on with it rather than sort of sitting in it and, and being upset too much. So he was great. This is actually the photo on the screen is or the one that just went with me with my hands in my face was uh, the last game in London. So it was the last match and I'd just come out of the tunnel and He's the first person I saw, so we were just having a private moment. Yeah, that's, that's touching. What happened, there was another influential moment, and what happened when you listened to Kirk Ashley at a seminar? You know, I've been very lucky in my life. I've, I, they always, the cliche is when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Um, after Atlanta, when we came third, I really thought we had the ability to win and the mental between here got in the way, like the six inches there was the thing that lost us a gold medal in Atlanta, nothing to do with our physical ability. Um, and so after that, in 1997, Keurig was in a seminar and, and I was sitting in the seminar, we came third at the Olympics, and he said, in the middle of his presentation, he didn't know who I was, he said, nobody remembers who comes second or third at the Olympics. And of course, I like part of me want to um, rush the challenge stage. him. Oh. Yeah, yeah, rush the stage and challenge <laughs> yeah. him, and, and probably hit him with my ball bag as well. But um, you know, it really sunk in. It, it, it was true. Uh, everyone loves a winner. Everyone loves a gold medalist. And you know, as much as they say it's great to make the Olympics and it's great that you won a medal, you know, every, deep down, everyone wants to reach the summit of their chosen career. Um, and the summit for us was the gold medal. So. Everything Keurig said really made sense to me and, and I went up to him after the presentation. I said, hi Keurig, you won't remember me. My name's Natalie Cook and I came third at the Olympics. <laughs> and, and he tried to like push his words back in and say how fantastic that was and I said, it's okay. I totally understand because of everything you've said, I want you to take us to the gold medal in Sydney. And that was, you know, he had a three-year window and he said to me, Sure, that sounds great. Let's go and sit down at the coffee shop and work out the plan. And I said, no, 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 it's okay. It's three years away. We don't have to do that yet. And he said, well, that's where you're wrong. 
He said, if you want something in your life, you have to take immediate action right now. Something you have to take one step towards your desire right now. And that step for us was going to the coffee shop and we wrote on a napkin the plan for the next three years. I mean, very um, high level, like top level plan. It didn't have much detail. And he then worked with us for the next three years, or with me specifically, because Kerry and I had a moment where we were apart. And he worked with me for three years. And it was the, one of the greatest times of my life as Steve was involved as well. We did fire walking, glass walking, parachuting. We rock climbed with blindfolds on for trust exercises. Wow. Uh, we, we just did some amazing things. He, he was awesome, still is awesome, and, and we're in communication all the time. So what were some of the things on the napkin that you remember? Um, well, it had gold medal day, so we, we worked backwards, and that's part of the strategy is working from the top down the mountain rather than starting from the bottom of the mountain looking up is very daunting. So mm -hmm. put yourself at the top of the mountain, gold medalist, Sydney 2000, and then work backwards. So we then outlined the... Um, the years that followed, the world tour that was coming, the world championships, what we were going to do along the way in terms of performances to, to step our way up to go to a gold medal. We'd never won a medal at that point. Oh, sorry, we'd won our bronze medal at the Olympics, but we'd never won a gold medal at a world tour event. So we had to step our way and map that out, and, we, and that was it. But really, the biggest thing was win gold Sydney 2000 on the napkin. That was in 1997. So we did everything possible for that to happen, and obviously history says that the dream came true. That's, that's great. I love that. Now, transitioning from athlete to business person, you have a real influential mentor for that. Who is that, and what, what have they done for you? Yeah, um, a, a guy by the name of Phil Hart. He was an event manager, and I came across him at one of my first events post the Olympics, a charity function, where you know I thought I was unbeatable at that stage, and and I bought a charity auction piece from him, and then he said, "Oh, who are you?" And we started to chat, and I was a golfer as well. I did a lot of uh, corporate golf that he continued to help me with, but he sat down with me and he said okay, let's turn this gold medal into real gold financially in a, from a business sense and a corporate commercial sense. And I became a professional speaker, um, a team building speaker, a motivational speaker. I also did a lot of corporate golf hosting and played corporate golf. But from a sponsorship point of view, he taught me how money is not everything because that's what I said, oh, how do I make all this money? And he said, money is not everything. And I thought, well, you, why would I come to you then? You're crazy. Money is everything. And he, he said to me, write a list of everything in your life that you pay for or everything in your sporting career that you pay for. From flights to car, like a car to drive around to protein powders, massage, food. And then he said, okay, go and, your job is to go and get all of those things for free or as many of those things as you can for free. And that equals money. It means you don't have to pay for it. It means they don't have to give you money. They just give you their product. So obviously, if you go to a bank, the only thing a bank has is money. So that could have been a good thing. Um, but they give you their product. So I, I had a, a car from my car sponsor, Kima, Kima Cars. I had flights from Qantas. Um, I tried really hard to get petrol from BP, but that didn't, or gas, if you're an American, that didn't work. But some of them didn't work and some of them did. You know, the local baker to give me bread and fruit and uh, physiotherapy and massage I got for free. And it really was one of the greatest things he ever taught me. It was amazing. So how did you get that in that first car? Because the first one, like once you do it once, it kind of probably carries through. It's much easier. Tell me about that first time. Well, what you've got to do is, is you've got to be really good at asking for things and not not like you know there's a way to ask and then there's a way to really ask with the value that you can give back you know, the reason that I'm so okay to ask for things is because I have a strong belief that the value I provide back through my speaking or my corporate beach volleyball days at Sandstorm or you know my 
positivity and personality is of value back. That's why I can ask to receive a car. So I would go to um, the dealers, the car sponsors, the, com the big high-level companies. It was harder with a high-level company because often they were managed out of Asia or the US. So I would go to a local dealer that had local dealings in Brisbane and I said, if you provide me with a vehicle, these are the things I can do for you. And I would just list them off and I would be entertaining and engaging. And what I had to be okay with was if they said no. I had to be okay with the rejection because it, it's not really personal. It's about them being able to provide and see value. If they said no, I would just move on. And I would go around trying to get as many no's as I could because the best way to a yes is through a no. So you just no after no after no and then all of a sudden you're sort of sitting in the meeting, you've got to keep that same level of enthusiasm because you can't go, oh, this is my hundredth car company and ask for a car because they're not going to do it. You've got to go like it's the first one and then when they say yes, you almost fall off the chair because you've got 50 no's and my first ever car sponsor was Jeep, which is on the screen. Then I went to Kima Cars and actually ironically right now, I'm in negotiations with Jeep again to go back into Jeep. That is, the, you know what, that's the best color, that's the one I want right there on the screen. So I'm live in negotiation with them at the moment and it's just about willingness to, willingness to ask, willingness to get a no and, um, and belief in your value. And you could show them this interview. Like, look, I'm already promoting you. There's a, That's there's right. a. <laughs> well, I've got a Jeep thousands. on my vision. I've got a Jeep on my vision board. It's not quite that color, but that's the color I want. But you've got, you know, if you don't vision board and you've never vision board, then Google vision boarding. You, just like the gold story, you need to have a, a visual of the things you desire. And uh, that's what inspires you to keep going every day so that you don't give up. You, you'll still get feelings of giving up, but just look at your vision board and you just keep going. Yeah. And also with Phil, what happened when you went to Dubai? Oh, that was, that was awesome. When I went to Dubai, he said to me, I'm going to fly you to Dubai to play beach volleyball with the Prince of Dubai, Prince Hamdan from Dubai. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, right. And he did. He flew me first class over to Dubai. I had to sit and wait for the prince because that's what you've got to wait for the royalty. So I waited on the beach. Um, he arrived with six of his friends on jet skis underneath the Burj Al Arab Hotel, the famous one. We had the court all like, I've never seen sand so flat. You know, it was just meticulously groomed. Um, he was on my team, thankfully, because I didn't want to beat him because that couldn't, that wouldn't look good. So we were on the same team. We won this volleyball match, and I presented him with my one of my nets, volleyball nets, and gold ball um, with signatures on it of Kerry and I. And in return, he presented me with a beautiful Chopard watch with floating diamonds in it, and. Wow. So I gave him a tatty old beach volleyball net and a gold ball and I got this beautiful, elegant Chopard watch that I'm even afraid to wear. It's so beautiful. Um, but that's some of the great things you get to do. You know, I've played golf with Greg Norman. I've um, met Michael Jordan. I've, you know, I've done some amazing things. Yeah. And now, it, always, it wasn't always like that. You weren't always fly, flying first class. What happened early on? You have to raise money. Two, to, to go to some of these events early on. What happened when you were 15 and you didn't have, have enough money to go on a trip? Yeah, well, life is a cycle because I actually didn't have enough money for London either and we had to work really hard there because of GFC and, and everything else But and costs escalate. But back when I was 15, there's a local company here in uh, Queensland called Yatla, Yatla Pies. It's a pie company. It sells a meat pie. And I had to, that's exactly what they are, but mine didn't have happy faces on them. <laughs> they were big family pies, they were $5, and every pie I sold, I got $2.50. And the pie company got $2.50. Well now, just to tell you the, about inflation, 23 years later, the pies are worth $14.50, 
and the pie company only gives you 50 cents for selling their pie. So it's not, not quite a good return on investment as it was back when I was 15. So what I had to do was go around and ask people, and this is probably where I got my learnings of asking and being okay with people saying no. Not that I ever understood why they wouldn't want a good meat pie, but um, I used to go and ask people if they'd like to buy a pie. So in, in learning about strategies of, of selling, which I didn't know that's what it was back then as a 15-year-old kid, I would go and knock on the door and I would say, would you like to buy a pie? Now, there's two answers you can get there. One's yes and one's no, and often they were no. And I went house to house for about 12 houses and I got sick of getting no's and I thought there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better question I can ask that would get a better answer because it's the quality of our questions that give us the quality of our answers. So if we don't have what we want in our life, if right now as you're listening to me you don't have what you want in your life or you're not moving towards it, you need to ask a better question. It's about the quality of your questions. So I got a better question, knock, knock, knock. Would you like to buy four or five pies? Right, now the, now the person's having a short circuit in their head because they really want to say zero but they've been given a choice of four or five. So I would sell mass pies like that, four, five, some would, I'd say, what about 10 pies I'd try? I'd just have a game, it just became like a game. Some woman actually bought 10 pies because I said, would you like to buy 10 or 20 pies? So then this was great, then I'd get a knock, 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 no one home. So my last strategy was when no one was home was to write a little letter, hi, I'm Natalie, talk about the volleyball. I've just ordered you five pies. I'll be back to get my $25 tomorrow. And, you know, sometimes they wouldn't, they, they, they wouldn't be there. They'd never leave the money in the envelope. I'd leave them an envelope. And sometimes it worked. So it's about being creative. It's about finding a, a strategy that works for you and enjoying the thrill of the game. We are all too serious. Back to Superman. We are all too serious. We need to lighten up. This is a game. And, and be okay if, if people don't want to play your game. Go and find someone who does. Yeah. I want to talk so about... To, so to wrap that story up, yeah. the pies provided enough income for me to go on my first few volleyball trips, have spending money, and even have some money left over in the bank. So they were hugely beneficial to my career. Yeah. Love that. What about... You know, there's some, some things that we were able to fight through. You're, you're fighting through a lot of challenges. And what happened, you were telling me a little bit about in Atlanta, and you'd mentioned it. What happened when you were three to one? When it was three to one, you were behind. What was going on in your mind at that point? Yeah, well, this is where I realized that after this match that it wasn't about our physical ability. It was the rules have changed over the 20 years. Um, when I first started back in Atlanta, it was what we called side-out scoring and you only got a point when you served the ball over the net, when it was your serve. Nowadays, you get a point. It doesn't matter who serves. There's a point one for every ball that's served. So it was first to 15 and you could only win your points when you were serving and at 3-1 down. The Brazilian team was three and we were one. My head started to go into we're going to lose spiral. They're too good. We can't do this. I can't. I can't do this, and we're going to lose at three-one. So of course, when you tell yourself that over and over and over and over for forty minutes, you lose. And we lost really badly. We lost fifteen-three in the semi-final at the Olympic Games, and I came off devastated because I did feel like I was just in this spiral that was moving so quickly I couldn't even see the ball. So. Um, that's when, and, and just after that I came across Curic and that's when, when the things he was saying was clear to me that that was what was happening or happened in Atlanta. So fortunately, just through pure courage and intestinal fortitude and guts, we showed up the very next day in Atlanta and won the bronze medal and turned it around to, and I really became angry. I became angry that I let myself do that the day before and it was a case of fueling myself to, I'm not leaving this country without a medal. I'm not going home without a medal. And so that's what sort of, from the inside out, produced our bronze medal performance. 
and then I thought, well, that's really hard to maintain. It's really hard to maintain that level of anger, so I need to find a different way, and that's when Curic came into my life. Mm -hmm. And it was about shifting the mindset. And that takes practice. That you know, you can do the physical activity, set the ball, spike the ball, dig the ball, but you have to practice that mindset of keeping that positive and engaged every day. And that's why surrounding yourself with people you like better than yourself helps as well. Yeah. Now, the audience, there's so much great information here. Now, I want the audience, what's one thing the audience should do right now to get started in overcoming some of their personal or business challenges in their particular situation? Well, as I said before, it's a case of clarity of your desire. So what exactly do you want? And be specific. Not like freedom or financial freedom or wealth or health. I mean, that's too global. We need to be very specific. If it's a health goal, then it's a specific weight. It's a specific... Um, physical activity you're doing. If it's a business goal, then it's, you know, business are easier to do because they do business plans and they do specific uh, financials. But it may be bigger than that. It may be bigger than financials. If you want a financial goal and you want financial freedom, then what does that look like? How much money is that? Write that down specifically and get very clear. Now, from Curic's message, it's about taking immediate action. So as soon as you write that down, with inside your gold medal, which I'd encourage you to put it in a big circle with a ribbon and stick it on the fridge. That's your gold medal. Once you've got that clear, take the first step or three steps towards it. So what is it that you need to do? Do you need to get a personal trainer? Do you need to get a business coach? Do you need to uh, read some books? You know, what is it that it's going to take? And do it. You know, the Deciding that you can do something and then actually doing it are different things. So you've got to have the do power, not the I will power. You've got to have the I do power. So do it. That That's the, you know, at the end of the day, Nike got it right. Just do it. You just have to do it. When you're sitting procrastinating or thinking it's all too hard or it's not for you, then just get up and just do it. Can you talk a little bit about this? Um, in your book, and for people who haven't heard of it, can you tell them, you know, the what's the title of the book so people can check it out? It's called Go Girl, and it's it's the journey from my bronze medal in Atlanta to the gold medal in Sydney, and everything we did with Curic and everything we did with Steve, all the challenges along the way, and it really is it, it's it's inspiring. I have people every day come up to me still, 13 years later saying how helpful it is. It's a practical guide to your own success. And um, I had the best time writing it. I wrote that book before we won, and all I needed let to do was to add the last tra chapter of gold or s nothing, you know? And I knew that it would only be published if we won. Otherwise, it would be a nice story for my family and my grandkids. And um, so I was all ready to go. Ironically, that last chapter became the first it, because it sets the scene for everything we did, and uh, it, it's a it's a special book. I really love it. Because in this, you talk about the kind of what you just demonstrated, which is a mapping exercise, right? Yeah, we we do mind mapping. We map out what it is you want and the steps you can take to get there. And, and like I said, putting yourself on top of the podium or on top of the mountain first and working backwards. That is key. That is, if you get that today. And you've got your desire, and you, when you put yourself on top of the mountain, you have to feel the feelings, experience what it would look like to achieve your desire. And put that through your body, put that through your mind, and then just start the journey down the mountain. It's much easier to gather speed and momentum down the mountain and do the steps it takes than to put your backpack on and climb up Everest. Is So the way I would do Everest is a helicopter up the top and walk down. That's how I would do Everest. Nice. Right. Now I have two last questions um, before I, 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 there's one thing I wrote down that I definitely want to ask about, but there are two things. Um, one was about your book and there's just this amazing story from your book that I just need you to tell people, which is when the gold medal round happened, 
Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and this is from so your book. We, this is from this. Is this from Go Girl, or from yeah. a different book? Okay. No, it's from Go Girl. Um, when we were due to play the gold medal match, the Sydney Olympic Organising Committee had arranged for the road race, cycling road race, on the same day. Now, where we were staying, because we weren't in the village, it was a long way away from Bondi, we had a, this is the beauty of being the host country, we had a satellite village close to the beach, but on the particular day of the gold medal match, we couldn't get to the beach because they'd closed the roads. So, thankfully, someone realised this the night before and we shifted hotels into the hotel across the road from the volleyball court with all of the public, you know, that, that were staying at Bondi and and we became sort of just members of the public, whereas usually in an Olympic situation, you're in kind of a tight, secure area. Um, and we would walk across the, we walked across the road for our gold medal match to, to Bondi in, with everyone else, like backpack on, thongs on, off we go. Now, the reason this is a little bit um, shocking for us is because we had spent three to four weeks in our hotel or our accommodation, Olympic accommodation prior and all of a sudden, and we'd set up all of our gold, we'd set up our scoreboards, we were comfortable in our beds and then all of a sudden we had to pick it all up and move to a hotel the night before the Olympic gold medal playoff. So let me say at this point that you want to be really flexible and adaptable in your plans. This is another key skill of an Olympic champion is to be able to, or a champion in your life, to be able to adapt at, on any given moment. If it's not going to plan, shift. And that's what we had to do um, in the lead up to that match. So a lot of ca the coaches are like, calm down, calm down, because we're packing, you know, we're packing our stuff up. Um, but, you know, that was just another add excitement and colour to the journey. It was great. Yeah, I mean, so the last thing you want to do before a gold medal round is to have to pack up all your stuff that you're settled in for weeks and have to move. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But you know what? You've got to, you've got to do what it takes. And if you're willing to do what it takes, then nothing will stop in. Nothing will get in your way. Yeah, and so the other thing I wanted to ask you about is you have this great video series, Motivate, and one of the things you talk about in Motivate is rewarding yourself. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah, when I um, finished my career, you know, obviously I sat down and thought, oh, do I write another book, you know, the five Olympics and put all that together. And the times have changed so much that I thought, you know what, it's, a video, it's about a video series. And I designed a 30-day motivational video series to just give you the little insights to build your own motivation and design the life that you want using the little tools like there's a Superman day, um, there's a day about yoga, there's a day about meditation, there's a day about building how to design your what, why and your plans. So there's 30 day program, every day you get a little video of me for two minutes and then you print out a worksheet to fill in the worksheet and you get your own motivate me toolkit at the end of it. And after that, you should be set to go for your life to, on any goal. You just can refer back to the little tips and strategies along the way. There's even an app for you to help you out, but you'll have to watch the video series to see what that's about. But that, I designed that so that I, people, the, the number one question I got in the last four or five years was, how do you stay so motivated to be the best in the world for 20 years? And I had to reverse engineer my sustainable motivation and my sustainable success, and that's what's gone into this program. So instead of a book, which may come out, you know, the life, the five Olympics of Natalie Cook, but this is about practical tools for people, and you get a little bit of me every day to just sort of light that passion in case you've lost it. So it's cool. I, I love it. My my friends are loving it right now, and. It's just launched. Nice. Yeah. So why include reward yourself? Tell me why that's so important. Oh, yeah. Thanks for reminding me, Jeremy. That's why you're so good at what you do. <laughs> um, rewarding 
is the most important part. Often, especially if we've got a goal that's four years away and you have a big goal with your business, it might be a three-year plan, it's really important to put in little um, road signs or landmarks along the way that you know that you're on the right track. And when you get to those landmarks, uh, it's time to reward yourself. So in the 30-day motivational series, there is a reward day, and that's very early on because you should reward yourself when you start something. You should reward yourself on weekly landmarks that if you do the things you need to do, which is a tick a tick off um, chart, then you should get a reward on, on each of those weekends. And the small ones, you might be going to the movies, you might be going to dinner, and at the end of the month, then you can have like a weekend away or, or something a little bit bigger. You get to pick your rewards, and you should reward yourself every time you hit a little landmark. Otherwise, three years away and you haven't rewarded yourself, it gets pretty tough. Yeah. So what have you done that's memorable that you've rewarded yourself with? Well, I now reward myself almost every day. Like it is, I have movies are the things I still love to do. Mm -hmm. um, go out with friends to dinner, which obviously in my career I sacrificed a lot. I cooked a lot at home. I took my own chicken salads. So now I have a lot of those rewards. The day spa is my favorite place, you know, where you get pampered. Golf courses, I love playing golf, so they're on my reward charts. Yeah. And um, now I'm, I'm working on bigger rewards. So I've got a reward in pro it's probably a year away to go on a safari in Africa should oh, I hit cool. some of my goals in my nutrition business. So it, that's what inspires you and motivates you. And the best time to put the rewards in is right at the beginning. So right at the beginning when you're in the euphoric state of designing your desire, you're like, if I hit that, what would I go and do? You build that in. And then as you go backwards along the little steps that you need to achieve, what would I do when I hit that? Yeah. You might buy a coffee machine. You might um, you know, get a personal trainer. You, you might go on a trip to Sydney, Australia, if you live in the US, you know? Some of those little things. Yeah. So I have one last question for you before we go to some of the questions. And we were talking before Selena, and I'm like, we have to include this in there. This goes beyond the, the gold, and if that's possible. But tell yeah. us what's happening coming up next in Boston. Oh, yeah, I leave for Boston in a few weeks, and I've been in, I'm being inducted into the International Volleyball Hall of Fame, yeah. which is pretty exciting. There's a little town outside of Boston called Hollyoke, Massachusetts, where volleyball first started, and that is why we're going there for the induction. And again, I'm taking my mother, my father, yeah. and my partner, and we're going to go and celebrate because mum and dad wanted to be there for the end of the journey. They were there for the beginning, so let's be there for the end. Right. Um, there's only three people being inducted. Two of them are indoor volleyballers and one of them myself as a beach volleyball player. It's the highest honour outside of, of winning an Olympic gold medal. And the only other Australian in the Volleyball Hall of Fame, International Hall of Fame, is Kerry Pothast, my Sydney 2000 and Atlanta bronze medalist partner. So. It'll be very exciting. I think that's something we'll continue to celebrate. We celebrate every year our gold medal win, which, by the way, is September 25th, so it's not far. It's Wednesday. Um, it's 13 years ago we won in Sydney, and we usually celebrate together every year. So we're planning our 15-year celebration to be a big one. Uh, so look out, Bondi Beach. We're coming back. But the Hall of Fame, very excited. I've never been to Massachusetts, so... I look forward to uh, putting the Hall of Fame next to my name. Congratulations. And this Thank has you. been phenomenal. So I, I'm going to stop asking questions. I'll let the, the people out there ask questions, but thank you so much. I'm looking forward to just going back and watching this many times. There's so many key points you bring up. So thanks, Nat. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jeremy. You're awesome. Thank you. You are both awesome. Thank you so much, guys. A fantastic interview, Jeremy, and, and really appreciate you, Nat, just sharing all your tidbits there and all your insider story. It's always fantastic to hear the behind the scenes. You know, so often you hear these, you know, famous, successful people and, you know, a lot of people go, oh, they're so lucky or, you know, they're just talented and, but, you know, it's, 
human, just like everyone else, and uh, have gone through struggles just like we do every single day. And you know, it's how you choose to respond that that makes the difference. So um, it's really great to hear your insider story, Nat. Really appreciate your time today and and sharing with us your stories. Pleasure. I mean, uh, yeah, everyone sees the the bits on TV where you're performing, but you don't get to see what goes on, you know, every single day at practice and Believe me, it goes. It doesn't go to plan more often than it goes to plan. So, you know, just get ready to write new plans. That's the best part. You can create your own life. So true. So true. Um, all right, guys. Well, let's get into some question and answer time now. We've had a few questions come through. A few people who couldn't make it that wanted some questions answered. So, um, we'll get stuck into those. Uh, Tyrone has said, uh, "I live in a small town, and I find it hard to find people better than me." So, I guess you know, trying to find those like-minded people. Um, there's a few out there, but how do you find people better than yourself? Is there a strategy to it? Do you have any tips and tools around that, or is it just like you said when you know, when you want the teacher, it appears. How does that work? Well, you're lucky. You first of all, you're lucky you found WF Boss. I mean, that's first of all. There's a massive number of people, like-minded people, on this, and you can stay connected with them. The beauty of small towns now, which might have been challenging in the past, is the internet and Skype and and webinars and the WF Boss Summit. I mean, this is just amazing. I could never have imagined this happening five years ago even, let alone 20 years ago. But the this, this strategy is just being aware of when you, when you meet someone, be open, open your heart, ha create conversations with them that you're interested in and see if they're interested in them back. And when you find that connection with someone, whether it's in person or over the internet, then it's about fostering in that connection and keeping, keeping the conversation going. You know, when you, when you get a fire going, that you keep stoking the fire and you keep putting Kindle on top and you keep putting logs on top, it burns brightly. But if you just ignore the fire and you go away, then it goes away too. So my biggest piece of advice is to meet as many people as you can uh, on the internet or in person, go to functions, go to lunches, um, and maybe travel. So if you're in a small town, set one of your rewards as a trip to a a national conference somewhere or, or go to a new city, meet some new, for the purpose to meet some new people and to try and find someone better than yourself because that's the way to keep lifting the bar and keep your standards high. So hopefully there's something in that for you, Tyrone. Yeah, definitely. I think, thank you, Nat. It's, um, it is, you're right, like with technology these days, you know, so many Facebook groups and webinars, events like this that are online now, so it's not hard to, you know, expand yourself worldwide with staying in your own home, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, Nat, you are a queen of networking. And uh, do you want to just share quickly how you remember people's names? Because seriously, I mean, that's a big thing when you're out there meeting people to, you know, remember you, you, you've got a skill, you've got a gift to it. I've been out with you a few times and, you know, that is, uh, you know, we can remember people's first names and you start, like you said, the key in anything, life, business, uh, you know, is about relationships. And uh, obviously when you address people by their first name, it makes a huge difference. So what's your little... What's your little secret on how you remember so many people's names? Yeah, the key in today's society is connection. And the way to connect with people, the first and foremost way, the thing that's important to people is their name. So if you can remember their name and use their name in it, uh, it, it they think, oh, wow, we're, we're mates. You know, How does she know my name? Now, sometimes for me, Selena, it's quite entertaining because they've got a name badge on. And I used, so I used their name. I used their name in it. I'd say, hi, Belinda, nice to see you. She doesn't realize she's got a name badge on. She thinks I'm some magician and thinks that I'm the greatest thing. So if they've got name badges, absolutely use their name. Don't just say hello and, and um, if they've got one on, ignore it. The, then what I did was I went to a Dale Carnegie training course. Now, Dale Carnegie is from a long, long, long time ago. And some people in the new generation might not even have heard of him. So Google Dale Carnegie. There's a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. But even better than that, if you can get to a training course, there is a specific section in there about learning people's names. 
and remembering in general and the way they teach remembering is through learning people's names. So the little tip I can give you is that you repeat it in your head. So Selena, if I was to meet you for the first time and you said my name's Selena and I'd say hello Selena, nice to meet you, my name's Natalie. And and then after I've said it once, I keep using your name in the next two to three minutes of conversation. If someone else comes, I'll introduce them. I'll say, this is Selena, so that it's constantly going in my head. Then I would also go, uh, without speaking it in my head, Selena, 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 to repetition in my head while I'm looking at you because it's really important for the facial recognition. And if I know... Do, I asked the question, do I know another Selena? No. So if I did Jeremy, for example, I know another Jeremy. So I would try and link those faces together. And so you're just building up um, a, a recognition through repetition program in your head. Use their name as often as you can, even if you sound like a crack record. Mm, There's awesome. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. You, you are the queen of it. I've seen many people out there networking, but no one like you. So I know it's, a, um, you know, it definitely is a skill, but it's so powerful, especially like you're saying, especially when you're looking for sponsorship or, yeah, building relationships, which is so so crucial in business these days. So, and I, yeah. I find also when you, talking is one thing with people's names. I mean, you've got to be this type of person, and if you're not, just practice a little bit. It's about personal touch and if, if you can put a hand on someone's shoulder and you can shake their hand and hold their hand a bit longer or a hug if people are huggers and you can just hug someone, the personal touch, the hand on the shoulder is great, a, a great way to start. Personal touch is another way to connect straight into someone's heart. Um, you will find people out there that don't like it and will back away. That's okay. It's just like getting the no. you just got to learn and, and it's like... Um, you know, I don't know if you played that game as a kid with the cards, fish. We call it fish. Some people call it go fish where you turn a card over and then you've got to find a matching card. It's the same with if you find a non-hugger, remember they're a non-hugger. Don't go back in and try and do the hug and then they go, didn't you get it last time? Like <laughs> if they get uncomfortable, just remember. But the personal connection is the second thing after you've remembered their name that is the most powerful in connecting and networking. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Fantastic. Um, okay, we've got Brett who said, uh, when you're getting shut down by friends and family, when you've got a dream and a vision, how do you stay positive? I mean, I know you gave some great examples there with vision board and you just mentally got to say, I can, I can, I can, I will, I will, I will. Um, but those days when you're finding it really tough, what's your suggestion, Nat, on getting getting ahead? Yeah, Brett, that's a tough one. When it's um, when they're close friends and family, you know, it's very hard to tell them to go away. If they're not that close, then it's easy just to remove yourself from the stimulus. So like a hot stove, if you put your hand on a hot stove, it burns. The best way to, re to stop it burning is to lift it off. So if you're in a conversation with someone that's negative, the easiest way is to leave. Thank you, I have to go, I've got a meeting, bye. If it's close friends and family where you're in the environment longer, your job is to turn the conversation to the positive. Right? So it's constantly, and it's, and it's hard. It's not that it's easy to do. But your job, if they say you can't do that or that's not possible, you say, well, what's really working for me is this and I'm really enjoying this and I can do this. Your job is to turn them into positive people versus have them influence you negatively. And again, go to the toilet. If it's really hard, go to the toilet, go to the bathroom or go outside and leave the situation. Take a few breaths and come back in. Smiling is a good thing too. It's really hard for someone to be negative when you're smiling. Right? Mm -hmm. And you just say thank you and just say thank you for their comments and you say thank you but right now I'm quite happy being the best and being awesome by myself. If you're not going to join in, then good luck. So it's, it's repetition in your own brain. I know it's hard and you have to do it anyway because the only other alternative is to join in on their pity party or negative party and be one of them and that's not what we want because it's very difficult to achieve your goals when you're in a space of negativity. Mm. 
Very good point. Very good point. It um, kind of leads on to the next question by Tiffany. Um, Hold on, Tiffany. Can I go back one more to Brett? I've just Please made do. this up, Brett. I've made this up because I'm very good at making things up. So you know, like toilet freshener, and you, after you've been in the toilet, it's not good. You spray it, right? So I would have my own little bottle of toilet freshener, and I just spray it. if the room is negative, and I just spray it up in the sky, and the, everyone would go, "What are you doing?" Us, and you could just say, "Oh, I'm just clearing the space." Spraying my positivity around, right? And that they're the sorts of things you do, and then they will stop being negative because otherwise you'll spray them in the face. There you go, Brett. That's for you. Love it. There's a new product, Nat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that moves on to the next question, which by Tiffany, um, you know, you talked about mentors that were influential for you. What about books or movies? You know, sometimes it's tough to be surrounded by like-minded people. I mean, you can always read a book or you know, these days with your iPhone and, you know, you can get anything on your phone now. So any books or movies that have been influential in your journey? Yeah. Good question, Tiffany. Um, for me, uh, when I wrote Go Girl, in the back of Go Girl there is a reading list of about four pages of books I read. So um, the most influential for me when I first started was a book by Dan Millman, which was called Way of the Peaceful Warrior. And he was a trampolinist and it's about his journey to uh, overcoming the doubts and the challenges. And then, all, you know, I'm a Tony Robbins fan as a firewalker, Tony Robbins Awaken the Giant Within, um, all of Dale Carnegie, there's a book called The Richest Man in Babylon, that's a really good one, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. Now some of these authors might be older authors, it's the best material you will ever see. So go back and read the, you know, the encyclopedias of self-help because that's where the material is. The material doesn't change. You then put your creative spin on it and, and your playful, joyful spin on it and uh, it will serve you forever. From a movie point of view, you know, I love the Superman series. I love the Rocky series because there's a lot of messages in Rocky and I love Star Wars through Yoda and Luke Skywalker um, and when you watch them now they might be a bit sort of old-fashioned with their special effects but listen for the message. When Luke Skywalker was in there with Yoda and Luke's trying to lift a, a, his ship out of the water with his mind and he couldn't do it because it was too hard and he didn't believe, then Yoda has a few very good lines there that are very powerful. So I just watch them over and over. I'm still watching them. I love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and probably just one more to finish off with, Nat. Um, can you just share your story? This is right before, I think it was the day before you won the gold medal and you're on the Australian bus with Susie O'Neill um, and you know, you, this is, you know, like I said, the day before you won the gold medal, telling everyone that you were a gold medalist. Can you just take us through that? Yeah, part of, uh, and it's in the Motivate Me series, one of the days in there is called Yell the World, right? And it's about getting up on top of the mountain and yelling out to the world that you are going to achieve an Olympic gold medal. Now, most of my friends in the Olympic committee and the Olympic athlete community were thinking I was crazy and they were ducking for cover. They're like, you can't say you're going to win because you haven't. And... Part of the philosophy is in, in the way I build success is you have to hold yourself accountable. So by telling people, now all of a sudden you have to walk, talk, act and be and train differently. You have to train like a gold medalist before it's actually happened. And that's the only way that it can happen. So it's a bit of the chicken and egg. Do you succeed and then you tell people or do you tell people and then you succeed? My belief is you tell people and then you succeed. The other part with that is that by telling people, you may find someone along the way that may be able to help you. So this whole thing about networking and connecting with people, you may tell a thousand people of your dream and then the thousandth person you've told goes, I can help you with that. But the, the first 999 might not even care, don't even want to hear it, but when you find someone that can help you, it's all worth it. If you keep it to yourself, first of all, there's no accountability. Second of all, you won't do something. You might 
have a bit of will um, or I can power, but you need the I do power. And the most important part for me is that you will find someone that will help you. So it's really important to tell people. Now Susie O'Neill, she was really afraid for me and of course after we won the gold medal now everyone's like wow that was really cool. Um, but there's still, you know, James Magnuson is one of our famous swimmers who is in a bit of a bother because he told people he was going to win and he didn't. Mm. Now they're all upset for him. It's caused him quite a bit of drama in his life um, and stress. But James came second at the Olympic Games. I mean, it is the greatest thing in the world to go to the Olympics and win a medal of any colour. If I'd have won a silver medal and I was James, I would have painted it gold and been very happy and proud of my achievements. But it's a You've got to be mindful of the people around you and surround yourself with people that are going to support you. Um, and the challenge is when you're a public profile like that, it, it gets tough because there's not just a group of maybe 10, 20 or 30. There's a group of 20 million that want to do this and this. Um, but my view is tell everyone about your dream and see if you can find someone to help you. And the more people you tell, the more opportunity you have to help you. And the more people you tell, the more the dream becomes real inside of you and propels you forward. So yell the world. Mm, very good point. So important, isn't it? Having that vision, that belief. I love what you say about you know, reality just hasn't caught up yet. Yes, that's a big one. Actually, and Susie O'Neill couldn't get a ticket to the Olympic gold medal match and had to sit outside for a while until she eventually got in. But that's one of my favourites. So... Susie, you know, wasn't quite believing in us and didn't get into the stadium. But the view is that dream as big as you can, put it out there, and then do all of the things it requires and wait for reality to catch up to the dream. Now, we can't tell you how long that is. It could be a day, it could be a month, it could be a year, it could be 10 years. You could die trying, but I would rather you die trying and live a golden life with the view and desire and and passion and positivity, then go, oh, too hard, I can't do that, no one's going to help me, and live in that life. So put it out there and enjoy the journey and enjoy the race and enjoy the hunt and just know things may go pear-shaped along the way and be prepared for that too. Always prepare your what-if strategy at the beginning not when you've fallen off the bike and you've scraped your knee and you're crying and it hurts. Don't prepare your strategy then. Prepare it when it's happy and everything's going to plan. And when you fall off the bike, put your Band-Aid on, have a piece of chocolate and get back on your bike. <laughs> I love it. Love it, Nat. Some great, great points there. Awesome, guys. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. But I just want to quickly finish off by sharing how you can contact Nat and Jeremy. Um, here's our WF Boss page. So, again, just leave us comments, feedback. Like I said, we do truly love hearing from you. Now, Nat's site, nataliecook.com, uh, and also her there's a Facebook page. She's also got her Sandstorm Centre that she runs. Nat, what's the best way to contact you through your Natalie Cook? get over there and put your details in? Yeah, nataliecook.com and then sign up for my um, newsletter contact and that's once a month just to say hi. And uh, in the shop there is where you can find Motivate Me and the book and then the contact page is the best way to send something directly to me. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your success stories. I'd love to hear how you get yourself out of negativity and uh, how you're going with remembering all of your names. <laughs> Tiffany, Brett and Tyrone, thanks for the questions. You are good. You are good. Awesome. Thank you, Nat. So, guys, make sure you jump over there. Now, with Jeremy, he's got Inspired Insider. So he's a guru in these interviews and, and especially these inspiring stories. Like we were saying, you know, you hear a lot about these successful people, but, you know, you really don't get to hear what really goes on behind the scenes, which really makes it inspirational, makes it human-like to realise that, hey, I am just like everyone else and I can do this too. Um, so Jeremy's got a fantastic site there. Is that the best way to contact you, Jeremy? Jump on, 
on don't you page there? Yeah, inspiredinsider.com. There's a contact uh, contact us. You fill it out and love to hear any questions, suggestions, people who you think we should be interviewing that are motivational, inspirational like Nat and can share some of the big challenges they went through. Yeah, awesome. I know you've got a Facebook page there too. So now guys, Jeremy got it. Yeah. Jeremy got some answers out of me that I normally wouldn't give, Jeremy. So you're very good. So right. well done. Well, very good connection and in, you inspired my answers. So he is very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. There you go. There you go. An awesome duo there today. So thanks again, guys. Just a reminder that we have our next session, our next WF Boss session in just over 90 minutes with Adam Gibson. He's the founder of the world's leading Health Leaders Academy and he's going to be sharing with you your most important professional skill as a health fitness business owner. So tune in to find what that skill is. Again, it'll be another amazing value pack session. Make sure you log into the members area and register for that session now. Also too, a reminder that Nat and Jeremy's session will be made available in the next week in the members only area in three formats. You get it in video. MP3, so you can put it in, onto your phone or in your car, listen to it on, on your walks, um, and also in cheat sheets, so you can download the, pretty much the transcription with all the key points and resources that were mentioned today. You can rewatch, re-listen to this session as many times as you like as part of being a WF Boss 2013 member. Um, so guys, again, without further ado, I'm going to call this session to an end and say a huge thank you again. High fives to Jeremy High and five. Nat. High fives for uh, a fantastic session, very inspiring and uh, great to get all the behind the scenes stories and, and tips there, some very, very valuable points there. So um, thanks again, guys, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next session. But until then, take care and bye for now.